Well, there are reports of Iran now abolishing, abolishing the morality police due to months long protest. But how and when is unclear. Now, what we're talking about is the police force in Iran that enforces conduct, specifically um, a lot of it around women and what they can wear. It's not only around women, but this is the point of contention since the death of 22 year old Masa Amini. Now, did they actually abolish the morality police or did they not? This is what protesters wanted. But the New York Post points out uh, that this is a media scam. Uh, it says, no, Iran didn't banish the morality police. It duped the Biden administration. Hmm. Well, why? Why would the media report this if it wasn't true? I'm going to quote from the Post. Um, media criticism in this case is warranted with the need to reassess how newsrooms cover deceitful and repressive dictatorships like Iran. But coverage of the Biden administration's Iran policy must improve as well. The White House and State Department are trying to have it both ways, claiming support for the people of Iran while holding the door open to an economic bailout for their oppressors. So that's interesting. Secretary Blinken expressed solidarity with the protesters during a CBS interview Sunday, but in a separate appearance on CNN, Blinken was asked if nuclear negotiations with Iran are still ongoing, and his response was, we continue to believe that ultimately diplomacy is the most effective way to deal with this, but that's not where the focus is. Okay. In other words, an appeasement pact that would generate $274 billion for the regime in its first year, that's $1 trillion by 2030, remains on the table for Ayatollah Khomeini to accept at a time of his choosing. Contrary to Biden's pre-election -de pre declaration that he would free Iran, Blinken's comment signals a willingness to sacrifice the Iranian people if their oppressors would agree to delay a nuclear weapons by a few short years. So you can see how the administration wants to be on the side of the protesters, but still do business with Iran. Iran is an important um, country, an important diplomacy for the United States. Now, of course, a little background. Uh, three months ago, 22-year-old Masa Amini was arrested because reports are that her pants were too tight. It did not have to do with the hijab, which was originally reported. And she died shortly after her arrest, and her death sparked outrage, outrage over rules that led to her arrest in the first place, namely the morality police or religious dress codes. Um, the, her death was absolutely nuanced. We've talked about that before. Um, it has sparked protests though in which dozens of people have been arrested some sentenced to death and between 100 and 400 people killed although the reports are very unclear on that right now that exact number on monday protesters organized a three-day strike they were all asking for workers to shut down businesses in protest um, although many are saying we just can't afford to do this the protests can't continue to disrupt our lives when we have families to feed Still, it is causing a disturbance. Here's one Twitter user showing an empty bazaar in Isfahan. So, is the government listening to these protests or aren't they? Uh, the country's attorney general, Mohammed Jafar Montazeri, said that Iran has disbanded the morality police and will continue to monitor behavioral actions at the community level. And also, he said that they would review whether Iranian women should be required to cover their heads. So that does not mean that that law has been lifted. It means it is in the process of review. Um, and as per the Iranian law right now, all women above the age of puberty must have their heads covered properly. Um, but I don't know what the word properly means in this sense, but um, and also must wear modest and loose clothing. Uh, but it does seem that they are still required to cover their heads. In fact, local media reported this story that an amusement park in Tehran was closed after a photograph was spread of a woman not wearing her head covering and that the government will investigate and uh, pursue her. Um, so I don't know. What do you think? It, it, are they lifting this or not? Is this something that takes a long time to do or can they just, you know, um, we've seen this before uh, where the government, our government tells us 
that a regime has or has not complied with protesters and they've been wrong they were wrong in syria during the arab uprising when there were three requests of the uh, uprisings there and bashar al-assad actually gave in to those pro those requests um but we weren't told that so that's that's the reason that we should be questioning right now is our administration telling us that iran is lifting morality police do they have a a dog in that fight to tell us that which how do we see this at well, this point well and how does the united states also conflate these stories too when they have paid people involved in these protests who are actively involved in creating dissent so that it looks like there's a larger amount of protests than there actually are. We know that that's been un uh, involved. And of course, the response from the White House, President Biden, before the election, had said, of course, that you know, no negotiations until they, they end this type of behavior. We're not going to go negotiate with this, with, uh, with this regime, as they called it. Um, and when Anthony Blinken was on CNN this weekend and he made these comments, it sent off a firestorm of people saying, look how weak the Biden administration is. So these were the comments that set off this firestorm. Watch. Are nuclear negotiations with Iran still ongoing? First, let's remember how we got here. Um, we had a nuclear agreement with Iran reached by the Obama administration. It put Iran's nuclear program in a box. Uh, Unfortunately, getting out of that agreement, uh, which was the decision of our predecessor administration, has allowed Iran to push its program out of the box. We've gone from having a breakout time, that is the amount of time it would take to produce enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon, under the agreement was more than one year, now it's down to a matter of weeks. That's the situation that we find ourselves in. We continue to believe that ultimately diplomacy is the most effective way to deal with this, but that's not where the focus is. Mm, so diplomacy is the way to deal with this. Diplomacy, diplomacy, mm. diplomacy. I did not really understand that as a strategy. Like, that's like you just keep words. using that word. Yeah. I don't think it means what you th think it means. Diplomacy. <laughs> Diplomacy. Oh, well, here he is again this weekend or uh, yesterday saying the very same thing. Um, and this is another piece of this where he's, you know, he's playing right to the crowd and he wants them to applaud. Watch. The regime's actions have only deepened our conviction that Iran must never be allowed to acquire a nuclear weapon. We continue to believe that the best way to ensure this is through diplomacy. The benefits of this approach are borne out by the facts. Before the previous administration unilaterally withdrew from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement, Iran's nuclear program was in a box. Iran was abiding by its commitments on the agreement. Its nuclear program was the most rigorously monitored and verified in history. The breakout time needed for Iran to acquire enough fissile material to produce a nuclear weapon had been extended to more than a year. In short, the JCPOA was working. And that's not just our view. That's the judgment of international inspectors, independent international inspectors, as well as the State Department at the time. So a lot of propaganda from the, the the White House because under the Biden administration's watch, of course, they've been, you know, Iran has extended that program and has a, a continued, again, they've continued to say that the type of uranium that they're enriching, of course, is for nuclear power. And they are, in fact, building new power plants. Yes. In co cooperation with Russia, which is why the United States needs to up its rhetoric around Iran enriching uranium when the data, in fact, they released the numbers just last week. They said we're, we're enriching it to 60%. That's nowhere near needed for a power, for a weapon. Right. Uh, that's what's needed <clears throat> for power plants, which they intend to do because uh, the Ayatollah there is, is a Ba'athist, and Ba'athist philosophy is energy independence inside Arab nations. Well, they don't want that. They, no. Bathists want this. No, I know, but the United States doesn't want the them West to be independent. The West absolutely does not want right. this. Um, and in fact, Bathists are not are not really they they believe in equality for women um, because they feel like that is necessary for a modern society. That's not that, that that's not me saying what the Ayatollah what this Ayatollah wants. I don't know, right? But we are not we are not usually told what their politics are. We're just told we're told it through the lens of how we need to control them. Well, of course, and this is how the Western leaders portray Iran, right? So it's much more nuanced than they would have you believe. When you have the likes of Anthony Blinken and President Biden telling us that this regime is awful and is, you know, the horror of the world, and you have Tony Blair, 
Warmonger, we should all be concerned, of Warmonger UK Prime Minister, former UK Prime Minister and Warmonger Tony Blair, has been now, he's been working in the shadows in Iran for quite some time to destabilize Iran um, with the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Don't let that name fool you. <laughs> they just want regime change. They want Iran wiped off the map. That's exactly what they want. Of course, they wanted Iraq wiped off the map. That's why he joined, joined George W. Bush in doing that. And pushing anti-Iranian propaganda has been Tony Blair, completely ignoring the far larger pro-government demonstrations that have been taking place. So those have been totally ignored by the Western press. The Tony Blair Institute has been claiming that the overwhelming majority of Iranians are atheists and seeking to overthrow their Islamic government. And he keeps talking about as a scourge and evil of the world. So listening to Tony Blair and how he paints Iran. And a conventional desire for regional hegemony. What we miss in this superficial and Western oriented analysis is the core motivation, which is, was, and forever will be the promulgation of that ideology rooted in an extreme version of Shia Islam, which is the Shia equivalent of the more radical elements of the Muslim Brotherhood and of Salafi Jihadism. The internal IRGC documents which we analyze are explicit. The organization is committed to ideological political training of recruits. They proclaim an existential threat to Shiism from Sunni Arab Zionist Western Axis. They mandate on religious grounds the expansion of the revolution to other nations. They authorize the killing of Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, and pressure to make them give up their devious beliefs. And they share the same litany of extremist views on social issues, including the status of women, hostility to gay people, and the sanctity of their image of Islamic society. Now, of course, all of this may sound very familiar to you if you've been paying attention to Syria, because almost the same words. It's like right out of a playbook. Like, yeah, these are all, they, they, they hate Christians, they hate Jews, they hate all of these other people. When, in fact, anyone who's lived in Syria can tell you that it was one of the most cohesive, loving places with all sorts of religions and sharing in a community until the West got involved and helped destroy that, that, uh, that peace. So that's exactly what happens here. So is this correct what Tony Blair is saying? Uh, not even close, of course. He's a warmonger who's been pushing for the overthrow of this government for a long time. So you need to put it through that lens when you hear a guy like this talking, painting the whole country as extremist. Um, Satare Sadijai, an Eshtafan, an Iran-based scholar and teacher, spoke recently to our friend Max Blumenthal at the Gray Zone. And she says many people support the hijab and support the practice of wearing the hijab. Uh, but many Iranians oppose the morality police to enforce the wearing of the hijab. And all of this differs from province to province as you travel around Iran. Listen. I uh, finished my PhD in American studies and I studied propaganda analysis as part of my PhD dissertation uh, and the rhetoric of social uh, movements as well. Uh, so I have always been supportive of uh, the Iranian uh, government as the whole, like the notion of an Islamic Republic. But I have also been uh, critical towards a lot of the things that happen in my country, like uh, many of the other people who live here. So um, and for the issue of hijab, as someone who believes in hijab and has always practice it, uh, I am totally against the morality police. Uh, it's, by the way, in Farsi, the word that we use for it is uh, the guidance patrol. And, uh, but in English, it's usually referred to as a morality police. And I'm totally against it. And um, I have been a part of uh, the people who, especially women, who un uh, took it uh, online and used hashtags to talk about uh, how they do not believe in the morality police, even though they believe in hijab. Uh, and this is not something new. It has been put in place uh, from many years ago, uh, but it become more significant uh, this year. Uh, so even before the, these protests uh, and before uh, the th tragic death of Masa Amini, people were talking about it online, and I was also one of them. 
because I thought this was uh, totally unacceptable. So uh, her description reminds me a lot of the coverage we did last week around China. It's not an entire group of people that want to overthrow a government. Right. It is people who want very specific change inside of their country. They don't want someone arrested because their pants were too tight. Then you'd arrest everybody after Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, they don't. They don't want to be forced to wear the hijab. Right. They want that to be their option, and they don't want this morality police. Um, and they are protesting for something very spe specific. It's not necessarily a condemnation against their country or culture. Right, and a, an overthrow of their government. But of course, the West would have you believe that. And of course, when the West then pays people to go in and sow dissent, uh, and then sends the likes of people like Tony Blair to the to the podium to give speeches on this, you know, again, it's much more nuanced. Um, and of course, the Western press isn't going to pay, uh, play it that way. So we'd love to welcome your comments on this story. Uh, when we did a story in, um, it looks like October is when we did this story last October 4th, when we first reported about these uprisings, um, there were some people who didn't really understand the, they thought we were being regime apologists, uh, when mostly what we were covering was the United States involvement in sowing discontent in the Middle East, according to a survey that came out of a Silicon Valley research company. We know that the United States employs people to create so, social media accounts that are anti-government in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, or in Iran. We've known this because we saw actual examples of it. So we're not extrapolating too far to say that the West is involved. We know this. We are also not regime apologists. We realize that there are many ways to see this story, and uh, we just want you know the best for anyone who lives in these places. Right. We want the West to keep their nose out of there. <laughs> Stop sticking your nose where it doesn't belong and trying to, uh, trying to overthrow governments. How about that? And let the people of Iran tell their government how they want to live. There's an idea for you. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time, trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.